tonight on Need to Know, capturing the struggle for social change in America from behind the lens. A look at the photographers dedicated to documenting these struggles in U.S. history and whether imagery still has the power to create change. That's next. Also on the show, a renowned fashion historian and author makes a case for the impact of clothing and dress on our society just in time for Rochester Fashion Week. Don't go anywhere. Need to Know starts right now. of protests and demonstrations from the contentious Supreme Court confirmation vote of Brett Kavanaugh can still be seen on just about every social media platform. The photographs capture more than just moments in time. They also reveal a social movement in our nation that will likely go down in history. Whose Streets, Our Streets, an exhibition now at RIT, bears a familiar likeness to the types of imagery we're seeing in the midst of our current political climate. This eye-opening exhibition features the work of a cohort of photographers who captured a myriad of social issues in New York City that led to marches, demonstrations, and protests in the late 20th century and turn of the millennium. So how does social documentary photography further democracy? That's what the exhibit explores and what we'll examine right now with key figures involved in this unique display of work. Joining me for this conversation, photojournalists Joseph Rodriguez and Donna Binder. In addition, co-curator and photo editor of the exhibition, Meg Handler, and historian Victoria Walcott of the University of Buffalo. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being thank here. You. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you for having us. Regardless of where you stand in the Supreme <clears throat> Court confirmation vote of Brett Kavanaugh, when you see the images of the protests and the demonstrations taking place around the country, many focused on standing in solidarity uh, for survivors of sexual violence, I want to know what are your thoughts given your background and your expertise. And I'll give this first to you, Joseph. Well, I'm just, um, I go back to the 70s. I, I remember the women's movement. I was marching then as a youngster, and we, there was a lot of social issues going on at the same time. We had the, the Vietnam War, we had civil rights issues. So I grew up out of that generation, and so I, I see now a new movement for my daughters, for example, who are now you know, uh, younger and, and see the Kavanaugh situation and just get enamored and get sh strong to want to get out there and, and put their voices out there because they're really, really concerned about the number one issue for them right now would be turning Roe Ro versus Wade back. And, and I, I just saw all the hard work that was made back then in my earlier days to make that movement uh, or make that, that law come to fruition. So I, I see that now today. Well, Whose Streets, Our Streets opens today at RIT's Harris Gallery. And Meg, as co-curator and photo editor of the exhibition, I want you to please explain the concept, just uh, how this was developed, the timing of this exhibition, and really its purpose and intent. Well, the exhibition came, uh, the idea for it came out of a conversation between me and my co-curator, Tamar Carroll. Tamar was working on a book called Mobilizing New York, which is a history of protest movements in New York City. And through those conversations, I realized that uh, there is a sort of companion idea of a photographic exhibition, that the history was very robust. There was an overwhelming amount of images that not only I made, but the photographers at the table made and the 35 other people that were involved and um, the subject matter was also very diverse um, you know reproductive rights and uh, act up and housing and education and there were so many things we were talking about and photographing so um, you know we decided to contain it within uh, the time period of 1980 to 2000 because we thought that that was a period of time that hadn't really been looked at yet by photo historians um, 
And the first iteration of the show, which opened at the Bronx Documentary Center in New York, um, opened the week before uh, Donald Trump's inauguration. And the timing uh, was perfect and uh, organic. We hadn't uh, planned to open it before the inauguration, but that's what happened. Um, and I think that the timing of it allowed people to be a little bit more inspired, to have a little bit more energy and push behind them to go out onto the streets themselves, which kind of brings us around to Kavanaugh and what an inspiration that was to see the resurgence and to experience it in real time because of social media. Um, so we're, you know, we're very happy to bring the exhibition and these ideas and this history to another city, a bigger city and a bigger gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and to have historians like Tamar and Victoria yeah. involved with our work kind of adds another layer to it. Meg, you mentioned some of the social issues that this exhibit brings about, discusses uh, abortion rights, housing, race relations, police brutality, the AIDS epidemic, and more. Mm -hmm. Victoria, if you will, what was happening in New York City at mm -hmm. the end of the 20th century, the turn of the millennium, in regards to social change? And how did these movements, uh, these activists, what we see taking place through this exhibition, how did that impact the rest of the country? Uh, it's a great question. So one of the things that's so powerful about this exhibit and Tamar's work um, as well is that people think of the 80s and the early 90s as a period of conservatism, uh, sort of backlash against second wave feminism, backlash against the long civil rights movement. And there's certainly much to be said for that. And what's hidden, though, in that history are these multiple kind of interlinked protest movements um, act up and in response to the AIDS crisis, the reproductive rights movement as the Supreme Court becomes increasingly conservative. Um, when Reagan starts appointing justices. Uh, the housing struggles, you know, people are familiar with the musical Rent, for example, which documents some of those struggles. So this exhibit really brings that to life. Uh, and those movements were not just in New York City, not just in Manhattan, although that's where they're extremely visible. They were national and even international movements, if you think about the struggles in Central America and, and elsewhere. So it's a somewhat of a hidden history that's only now really being told. Joseph, Donna, and Meg, you two on the ground during this period of time. I want take us. I want to know what it was like. So I'm, I'm going to give this to you first, Donna. What was the experience like for you? What were you? I know, and just reproductive rights, uh, one area of focus for you in terms of your work. Uh, talk about what drove what you did. Um, well, I think there was so much going on, um, and as a photojournalist, um, you kind of needed to be everywhere or I felt like I did. So I covered a wide array of things. I think I started out with a lot of um, issues of homelessness, definitely reproductive issues. One of the first things I photographed as a young photographer were the sit-ins at Columbia uh, about the anti-apartheid movement. Um, and that was amazing, uh, powerful, and, and you could see how protests changed things. I mean, the calls for divestment and how the university responded. Um, and I think as a photographer during that time, having grown up um, in the 60s and 70s looking at images of the civil rights movement, um, for me, I felt like this is history that I am seeing and will be later, and it's important how you document things, um, or that you do document. And we were constantly being marginalized by, by the police as we covered events. I mean. Uh, and especially uh, as a female photographer, I think that I was always the first one that they would like pull out mm -hmm. and take my press pass and then try to teach me a lesson and have me come down to the precinct to have a meeting with them. Ever fearful, ever, ever uh, in a position where uh, you were fearful. Well, or yeah, but, or intimidated, intimidated. but like I, I think that um, it didn't work because it sort of made us a little more fearless in photographing. Um, and like, as you can see in the show, there was so so many different issues and a lot of different photographers focusing ultimately on, on different things, but um, in a way it was all interconnected, as you've said, about what was going on at, 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 in, at the time. Um, yeah. In an interview, Meg said that the photographers featured in this exhibit blended activism with their photographic practice. They are progressive thinkers. Joseph, is this something that you intentionally set out to do, to blend activism with your craft? Well, I think my, my story is, is kind of personal. 
growing up as, as a Puerto Rican New Yorker, you know, I experienced firsthand all the issues that I photograph. So everything I'm photographing is very subjective. So I spent years and years photographing in a community that I, that I kind of grew up with called Spanish Harlem. So those issues were housing, was something always being dealt with, AIDS, teenage pregnancy, education issues, employment issues. These were things that I grew up with. And as a child, you know, I grew up with watching documentaries on television mm -hmm. and, and seeing our newspapers and, and watching still images that were making impacts on my mind as a young person. And that's why I guess I fell into this world of photojournalism, because the power of the photograph does change things in our country. It has in the past. I had the question I posed at the beginning, in what ways does social documentary photography further democracy? How does that happen? Well, I think that it puts a mirror up for people. I think that the audience looking at our pictures are the pictures of other photojournalists. They either see themselves somehow in these pictures or they see people in a way that they've never seen them. So for example, you know, I spent a lot of time photographing the anti-abortion movement because I, I wanted to understand them and where they were coming from and not be angry about it or exploitive or use their propaganda. I, I tried to see them as, as whole individual people. And I don't think that people were used to looking at images like that. They were used to the signage and the exploitation of the idea. And um, so that was always my intent, was to, to, to show people in another light, because I thought that that did educate and it did open up people's eyes to other cultures, other ways of thinking, other politics. We were talking about social media before we, we just got this interview started with so many images that we can see on social media nowadays. Is that, does that change the impact uh, of some of these movements, or do you think it helps to further the cause? But, I mean, I, I, I think both. I think the idea and the, the Kavanaugh protests were a perfect example of being able to experience the resistance and the opposition in real time and to also see how the administration was responding to it and how all of these senators on the Judiciary Committee, I mean, it's constant commentary resistance, commentary resistance. It was, it was kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. well, before we close, and we've got 30 seconds left, and I'm sorry to do this in such a short period of time, and Victoria, I'm giving this to you. Uh, how do you think an exhibit like this just can open minds and kind of further us in this, in this time period that we're in right now? I think it can show the power of media, whichever kind of media you're talking about, um, to create real social change and also create a kind of radical empathy um, and to give dignity to the homeless, for example, or to somebody who's suffering from AIDS. Uh, that's what photography does. It gives that dig dignity and allows for empathy. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. But a huge thank you to my guests for, thank thank for you. being thank here you. and joining me today. Do not miss this exhibition, Whose Streets, Our Streets, is now in Rochester and opening today at RIT's Harris Gallery. The exhibition will run through November 2nd. For more information and gallery hours, go to whosestreets.photo. Fashion Week of Rochester is in full swing, showcasing the work and talent of local clothing designers. That Fashion Week concept, which is celebrated by cities around the globe, was first introduced by legendary fashion publicist, the late Eleanor Lambert. Lambert is credited for putting American fashion on the global map. Renowned fashion historian, author, and lecturer John A. Tiffany beautifully captures Lambert's story and legacy in his book, Eleanor Lambert, Still Here. Tiffany stopped by the WXXI studios during a recent visit to Western New York to share Lambert's story, give us a glimpse into his new work, and to explain the impact of clothing on our culture, our society, and our lives. Take a look. When it comes to renowned fashion historians, John, I am quite certain that you are the first to grace the Need to Know set. So welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I'm sure viewers are intrigued with you and, and what you do and how you believe fashion influences our world. So just mm. to begin, explain to me how you got into this profession and the life of a fashion historian. Sure. Well, 
Um, I grew up in a very small town in California that was obsessed with horses, horseback riding, whether you rode Western or English, and or, or what sports you were in, and I was in none of those. <laughs> and uh, a, a teacher that I had in high school who actually dedicated my book to encouraged me. He, he noticed I had a passion for clothing and fashion. And so I did a, ended up doing a speech on um, a fashion event which took place, which was a competition between American and French designers. And um, that sort of became this catalyst, this central point of my life. And I met people who were involved in fashion. So that is really how I got involved. And I always loved the history of fashion. I, I love fashion, which is of the mo which literally means of the moment. But I like hearing how we got to that point and, and finding out. For some people, uh, fashion is viewed as trivial and superficial, not mm. having you know, much necessity or importance in our society. Mm. How would you challenge people with that mindset? Well, first of all, on kind of an artistic point of view, I would challenge them and say fashion is the most artistic expression we can do every single day. So we, it's a necessity. So I don't think anyone would say food isn't a necessity, but we do need to be clothed, especially here in Rochester <laughs> where it's a little cold. Right, right. Um, but also fashion was the number one industry in the city of New York um, before fin the financial business took over in the 70s, but it was also the number one industry in our state. Um, fashion involves lots of different industries, transportation, agriculture, clothing. So I feel it's a form of expression of art, but also just industry in our country. It's a huge industry. Well, you have worked and created special bonds with some of the most respected game changers uh, in the world of American fashion, uh, one being the late Eleanor Lambert, a publicity genius, uh, credited for putting American fashion really on the global map. And I want to know, I should point out, in Rochester, like many other cities around the globe, we have Fashion Week. And mm. she is the one who's credited for creating this concept. And I want to know first, how did you meet Eleanor? Mm. And also explain her significance um, to the fashion world and our society. Well, what I was talking about, that fashion show competition, um, was actually created by Eleanor Lambert. Um, I had no idea of that when I was doing my research, but my teacher um, pushed back and said, well, you have a couple of newspaper articles about it, but you need to get more information. You have to do a live interview. So I interviewed a New York Times reporter who said to me at that time that Eleanor Lambert was the creator of this event and that I should call her, and I did. And later I met someone who was on his last day working for Eleanor Lambert when I was in college, and later he suggested that I go work for her, and I kept being surprised that she was still alive because I ended up working for her when she was 93 years old. And um, when you worked for Eleanor Lambert, you really didn't have time to know too much about what happened yesterday, much less today. She was always focused on the moment and what was happening next. And so one day she asked for something in the files and I went to look in the files and I said, did you know Halston? And she said, well, I discovered Halston. So she was First, primarily, she was a, an, an art student, and she was the first publicist for artists. And many of those artists she made famous in their lifetime, which had never really happened before. And that was in the 1920s. Um, then someone said, well, don't you think fashion is like art? And she agreed that in the hands of some, it was. And what she noticed was that her artist clients um, were from all over the world. Noguchi was Japanese American, Cecil Beaton was British, um, and they were well respected, but American fashion designers were considered the stepchildren of the fashion world, whereas the French designers were considered fantastic and looked up to. And what happened was that the US government could see that the war was coming. They knew the war was coming. And they started something called the New York Dress Institute, which was a collaboration of the Garment Workers Union, the state government, the federal government, and designers. And it was intended to keep the fashion business going during World War II. And um, they had a, a terrible ad campaign that said, aren't you ashamed not to wear a new dress? And they had a dying soldier looking up at Martha Washington. But the department stores hated this ad campaign. And they suggested that the, the New York Dress Institute hire Eleanor Lambert. And Eleanor Lambert said publicity would be a much better way than these corny ads. And what she decided was to not, the editors of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar were the only, those were the only two fashion magazines. And what she figured was you could bring editors from other towns. And Harper's Bazaar and Vogue didn't really care about American fashion. So she invited these other editors to come to town to see the collections of American designers. And that was the first Fashion Week. Not unlike Fashion Week now. Um, she took them to Broadway shows, and there were 53 editors, 
And those uh, Vogue editors and Harper's Bazaar editors certainly made their way to Fashion Week by the end of the first week. And what happened was Eleanor Lambert suddenly, within that first week, became the most powerful person in the fashion industry. So there had never been a Fashion Week before for editors. Mm. And so it was the press who then, these were pe women who were writing about cooking and cleaning and now they were fashion editors. And she had convinced the publishers that perhaps the department stores had placed ads if they wrote about more about fashion and all the publishers thought it was a fantastic idea. I'm, I'm curious because you you told me before that Eleanor really had to learn how to navigate this uh, male-dominated world mm. at a time when gender roles were very different than they are yes. today. Yeah. Yes. So how complicated was that for her? In some ways, I don't think it was very complicated. Eleanor Lambert's husband was a very high-powered publicist. Uh, he he worked for William Randolph Hearst. Pu he was a publisher, I should say, and he was a publisher of one of the lar the largest newspaper in America, the American Standard Journal at the time. And so he helped Eleanor a lot to, na to navigate that world, but she was very smart. And she, um, I think one of the things is she just did her job and she didn't really listen to designers. They would question her and have creative ideas, but she would not really push back. She just would go around them and do what she knew was the best way to do it. Um, also, I mean, I think she would flirt, she would smile, she would laugh, <laughs> and she would say, shake her hand yes to the man, and then she'd just do whatever she wanted to do anyway. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, she got things done that way. Wow. Yeah. Well, when we look at diversity and fashion now, mm. gender and fashion now, there has been a little bit of backlash in our society just in terms mm. of lack of designers of color, mm. um, of all shapes and sizes, and of all abilities as well. And being featured whether on runways or uh, in magazine editorials and retail stores, you name it. How, how do you view this issue um, and what do you think necessarily has to happen in our fashion world to create more inclusion? Mm. Well, I look to the example of Eleanor Lambert who really, um, she never said it, she never talked about it, but she would say to designers, even when I worked for her in the 90s, oh, you might want to have a black, um, which is the term she used for African-American, you might want to have a black model. You might want to use a black fit model. You might want to hire this great Latin kid I met at FIT. I think the people in power have to be pushing that. And I think you're starting to see that a little bit with some of the magazines, especially out of British Vogue and um, na now Vogue. I think there's, I think pushback wherever it starts then starts to snowball, where you see American Vogue letting Beyonce be the guest editor. And I think that that's exactly where it needs to come from. I think that sometimes we think it needs to come from the bottom, but it needs to come from the top. Eleanor Lambert was the most powerful person in fashion. So when she suggested something, like at the Versailles exhibition, it was her idea to hire half. There were 34 models representing America. Half of those models were not white. And she pushed for that. And she felt it was what was happening in the culture. So she wanted that to be reflected on stage. I think the people in power have to be very focused. And I think they have to be inclusive. And they have to, to do it themselves. And not react to the audience. I think they have to be. I mean, fashion itself is about creativity and what's new. So not being safe. Well, you do have a new book coming out in I 2019, do. and that's focused on another incredible figure in the world of fashion, <laughs> yes. Don Mello. And so for viewers familiar with that famous store, Bergdorf Goodman, or yes. the line fashion label Gucci, she is credited for saving and really reviving both. So what is it about Don that you have found to be so intriguing uh, to, that you want to put into a, a new book? Mm. Well, Eleanor Lambert was um, definitely not she was strong, but not silent. <laughs> and I find Don Mello to be the strong and silent person of fashion. She was hired, she had worked um, for many years before she went to Bergdorf Goodman in the early 70s or mid 70s with a man by the name of Ira Niemark. Um, they had worked together and, and Ira Niemark knew that she was probably one of the most creative people in fashion for uncovering new talent. And so he hired her and he really nurtured her and that that's something that I really get into in the book on Don Mello was here's a person who is super creative but had the support of strong men. Um, at Bergdorf Goodman, Ira Niemark backed her, supported her, but she was always in the background. She was letting designers take a bow. She was uh, finding the most creative designers and really challenging and changing society in New York when New York was in a really dark phase and bringing new energy to fashion and fashion shows and retailing. 
And when she went to Gucci, she had another strong um, person, uh, strong man behind her, totally chauvinistic, Maurizio Gucci, but who supported Don Mello and understood that Don Mello, and he stood back and let her do what she needed to do. So it's kind of a interesting commentary where, where Don, for Don Mello, which is this powerful, strong woman, yet she had men backing her who were, let, who were saying she's really amazing. Um, so you think, what happens if the men are jealous or are not supporting women, mm -hmm. you know, someone like Dawn. Um, but Dawn really understood audiences and what she also understood was what they might not know they want, what was coming down. You know, for instance, when she brought Azadine Alaya to New York, women hadn't been wearing tight 40 style clothing, although the clothes weren't f like the 40s, they were tight fitting clothes. and that ushered in the whole look of the 80s. You will be featured on CNN in a special series airing next year focused on style for the last 100 years. So before <laughs> we close, I have to ask you, how do you see style uh, and dress evolving and influencing our society mm. in the future, maybe 10, 20 years from now? I think that technology has changed everything, first of all. I think that, um, and the people who run technology, the Silicon Valley yeah. people. They don't wear suits, they don't wear ties, um, they dress very casually, and I think that people can work from all different places. And I think that's one huge influence is how we purchase fashion and how we um, interact with fashion versus going to a store or seeing it on the street as much as now we see everything online. I think there's been a huge um, amount of democracy brought, brought to fashion and we see really the preponderance of the American look which is people being more casual and more wearing more sportswear and so um, I just think there's been a huge influence from technology and how we live our lives that we can actually buy clothing on our phone. Well fashion historian John Tiffany it's a pleasure <laughs> to have you here thank you. Thank you so much. That was renowned fashion historian, author, and lecturer John A. Tiffany. To check out one of the runway shows or special events at this week's Fashion Week of Rochester, running now through Saturday, October 13th, be sure to go to fashionweekofrochester.org. And that wraps up another edition of Need to Know, Rochester's news magazine. I'm your host, Helen Bianduti Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight and throughout the weekend here on WXXI. Have a great night.